Hi, welcome to another video in the ASA level managerial accounting series. Today's video is on investment appraisal and what techniques can we use to analyze investment opportunities and then finally take a decision as to what investment are we going to make or what are the uh, projects that we're going to select out of the available options. What do you mean by investment appraisal? So investment appraisal refers to the analysis of one or more projects that are available. Projects are nothing but opportunities. So there may be opportunities available to even individuals or even firms. So as individuals, we may have opportunity to invest in, let's say multiple companies. So we may have to analyze the necessary details and then decide finally as to where we want to invest. Same way firms may also have multiple projects or opportunities in hand where they have to invest and they expect a certain return. So investment appraisal techniques will help them analyze these opportunities and finally they'll be able to decide which opportunity is best suited for them and which one they should be choosing and which one they should be ignoring or letting go. So what methods do we have in syllabus to do our investment appraisal? We have the accounting rate of return, the payback period, the net present value method and the internal rate of return method. So these are multiple ways in which a, a firm can analyze the projects. Results that you may get using these methods may differ. For example, let's say you have two project options, uh, project A and project B. So if you use accounting rate of me uh, return method to analyze, it may feel that project A is better. But maybe using the net present value method, project B may feel better or it looks uh, B looks better option compared to A. So it is possible that these appraisal methods may yield different results. So we will also be looking at uh, advantages and disadvantages of these methods. In short, briefly, we will understand them. Uh, so because when you have contrasting results uh, between these methods, so you may have to pick up that which method are you going to give importance to and then take your decision accordingly. Before going ahead with these methods, we will first understand some important terms that we are going to use consistently in this chapter. The projects or opportunities that a firm may have can be divided into two categories. One, they are mutually exclusive projects. So mutually exclusive projects or opportunities are the projects that compete with each other. So let's say project A and project B, you can call them mutually exclusive projects when you have to choose either of them. So you can choose either project A or project B. You can't choose both together because investment in both together in both projects together is not feasible. It's not possible. And that's why they are mutually exclusive projects. So investment in one depends on the other one also. While project A and project B can be called independent projects when you can choose to invest in both the projects at the same time or you can choose to ignore the projects uh, because they're independent of each other. Investment in one project does not affect or is not affected by the investment in other projects. Such projects are called independent projects. Then in this chapter, for some methods, we are going to focus more on cash flow and not the net profit. You may be aware of the term net profit. So net profit is a profit that you calculate using the accounting rules, accounting concepts. You prepare the income statement once the year ends and then you can get the net profit. Cash flow is a little different compared to net profit. So cash flow measures what is the real inflow or outflow of cash because of certain project. You may wonder that what would be the difference between cash flows and net profits. So cash flows are different from net profit because in calculation of net profit, there may be some non-cash elements or non-cash adjustments that have been done. For example, uh, let's say provision for doubtful debts, let's say depreciation entries. So because of that, what happens is the actual cash flow may differ from the net profit that you get as per income statement. Now for some methods, it is important to arrive at the cash flows and not the net profit. The next important term that we have is called the time value of money. It's a concept and this concept is important for the net present value method and the internal rate of return method, the th third and the fourth method that we we've seen in the previous slides. So what do you mean by time value of money? It refers to the concept that a sum of money that is received at different times is worth different. I mean, 
money that is received earlier it is much better than the same amount of money that you receive at a later date that is the concept of time value of money and why does this happen this happens because of the concept of compounding what do you mean by compounding so let's say you invest a certain sum of money right now you give it to your bank and the bank will give you a certain rate of interest so after one year your money that you invested with the bank that increases you the principal amount remains intact plus you get some more interest on it so we can say that the amount that you invest at present is called the present value of money and whatever the bank gives you after one year including that interest that is called the future value of money so this process of adding the interest on to the principal amount this process is called compounding so future value of an investment is the money that will accrue when a certain sum of money is invested at present and present value of money is uh, the value of any future amount when you remove that element of interest from it and you get the present value of future sum of money so to arrive at the future value and present value there is this formula so simply put future value of any amount is the amount that you have today multiplied by the compounding factor and present value of any money any future money is the future amount multiplied by the discounting factor now out of these two formula we need the second one for our methods but i will explain to you how am i getting this formula because if you not if you not studied the concept of time value of money it will be difficult for you to you know remember this formula or understand this so let me take a quick example to explain in detail the concept of time value of money and also what do you mean by these terms exactly future value of money and present value of money and also how did i arrive at this formula let's understand some concepts of time value of money in detail so that it will help you even throughout this chapter and also after a levels somewhere in uh, any other syllabus or somewhere in life these concepts will help you for sure so let's see we're talking about 100 dollars at year 0 which is present time and this 100 dollars we are uh, willing to invest it with uh, a bank that is offering us 10% rate of interest so we want to know how much money are we going to receive at the end of the first year so we will be obviously receiving the principal amount plus the interest on that principal amount is 100 dollars plus how much uh, interest are we going to receive 10% of 100 dollars what i can do is i can also express this as 100 dollars because i'm taking 100 dollars common out of both principal and interest and in brackets what i'm going to do i'm going to do 1 plus 10% which is 100 dollars into 1 plus r if i have to mention it in terms of a formula p into 1 plus r so this p into 1 plus r you must have studied somewhere even in uh, earlier grades in mathematics about simple interest so it's the same thing p into 1 plus r when i do the calculation i'm going to get 110 dollars so the bank is going to pay me 110 dollars for 100 dollars invested at present time and a 10% rate of interest if i continue with the same 100 dollars 110 dollars uh, how much would the bank give me at the end of year 2 so again 10% so this time we'll will be using this p into 1 plus r way uh, 110 dollars into 1 plus r which is 10% so 110 into 1.1 which is 100 121 so this is what we are going to receive at the end of year 2 now if 100 dollar is if you are talking about 100 dollars at present time this 110 dollars becomes the future value of current 100 dollars 121 dollar becomes future value of current 100 dollars obviously 110 dollars is future value at year 1 and 121 is future value at year 2 basically future value means uh, the future value of current sum of money which is including that interest element now in this formula which is p into 1 plus r what you see here this is called the compounding factor compounding factor means anything when added on to the principal amount that will yield a higher value 
because that also includes that element uh, interest element and you will be able to arrive at the future value so what is the formula for calculation of future value future value is equal to the principal amount multiplied by the compounding factor compounding factor is 1 plus r now if you're talking about just one year at a time it will be 1 plus r but if you're talking about let's say two years at a time you will have to multiply it by 1 plus r those many times so it becomes 1 plus r raised to 2 if you're talking about future value of hundred dollars at 10 percent after four years so you'll have to say 1 plus r raised to the power 4 this is how you get your compounding factor so compounding factor depends on two elements it depends on the interest rate which is r and it also depends on the time interval which is n so number of years as you change these variables interest rate and number of years your compounding factor changes and your future value also changes so if you increase your interest rate the compounding factor increases and your future value also increases if you increase your number of years that you are talking about obviously the compounding factor increases and your future value also increases now this is about compounding factor or calculation of future value in the same way we can also calculate the present value of any future amount if we know what we are expecting at the end of year one and year two we want to know how much is the present value of that at year zero the basically the reverse of what we've just done so let's look at that also with the help of an example let's say we are talking about year zero and in year zero we have invested or we want to invest a certain sum of money that becomes let's say 216 dollars in year one we are not aware of the amount that will be invested at year zero we don't know that what we know is the future value which is 216 and we know that the current rate of interest or the rate that we're going to use is eight percent so is it any is there a way that we can calculate this amount at year zero yes uh, what did i tell you that future value is equal to the principal or you can call it the present value multiplied by 1 plus r raised to the power n so now we will use the same formula to arrive at p p is nothing but present value or principal value present value is equal to future value divided by 1 plus r raised to the power n so this 216 we can calculate the present value or how much is it worth at the current time so that will be future value into 1 upon 1 plus r raised to the n it's the same thing i've just separated the future value and the uh, 1 upon 1 plus r this future value is 216 dollars and 1 upon 1 plus 8 percent because our r is 8 percent and since we're here talking about just one year so n will be one if you're talking about two or three years or four years at a time accordingly n which is the time interval that will change so when you do the calculation you get 216 multiplied by 1 upon 1.08 that gives you 200 dollars so this 200 dollars is the present value which when invested at 8 percent for one year will yield 216 basically it's just going reverse previous example we saw how to calculate future value from given current present value and in this case we've calculated present value if we know the future value now in this case this 1 upon uh, 1 plus r raised to the power n that you see here this is called the discounting factor in the previous case we saw the compounding factor compounding factor is anything that increases the money obviously if you're talking about present value and you want to calculate future value money will increase in future because of the interest element but if you're talking about a given future value and you're calculating the present value the present value will obviously be lower because that future value includes some present value and some element of interest and we are removing that element of interest to get arrive at the present value so present value will always be lower than the future value remember that and this is called the discounting factor now why are we studying all of this because in the third and the fourth method which is the net present value method and the internal rate of return we are supposed to calculate the present value of future cash flows or future amounts 
So there I will be expecting you to know this formula that present value is equal to any future value or cash flow multiplied by the discounting factor. This is what is important for you to understand. And you don't have to calculate the discounting factor on your calculator by yourself and then write it. Discounting factor will obviously be given in the question if you just write it as it is. It's just that I'm telling you all of this so that you understand what are you doing when calculating the present value. I could have just given you this formula, multiply the future value with discounting factor and get the present value. But you also have to understand what are you doing so that you do it in a better way. Now the final question that may come to your mind in some for some students that may come to your mind is that how do we know uh, what R to use or how does the firm know what R will be, they be using? See because when you're calculating the discounting factor, when you're using the discounting factor, the discounting factor will change because of the rate of return or the rate that you are using. Here it is 8% the R but if I change it to 10% or 12% or 15% the value of the discounting factor will keep on decreasing and even the present value will fall because higher the interest element lower will be the present value element in that future value. So how does the firm know what rate of interest or what rate to use? So this rate uh, will depend on the cost of capital of the firm. You will come across this term in the questions and that is why I'm just mentioning it here. Cost of capital means how much does it cost to the firm to raise additional source of fund, additional funds for the business. For example, if the firm is uh, approaching a bank and willing to take a loan for its project and if the bank tells the firm that we will be offering you a 6% annualized rate of return or sorry rate of uh, interest on the loan. In that case, the cost of capital, it means the cost to service the capital is 6% and they will be using discounting factor based on 6% rate. So the R is always chosen based on the cost of capital of the firm. That's is that, that much only you should be knowing. Uh, they will not be testing you on the details of cost of capital, on the calculations of cost of capital, but just know the meaning of cost of capital. Because if they mention, let's say cost of capital is 6% and they are giving you discounting factors for 6% and 8% both. How do you know which one to use? So you will be using the discounting factor for whatever is the cost of capital of that firm. So I think these concepts about time value of money are more than enough for you to understand this chapter. Let's go back to a presentation. So I hope now you have understood these terms and you also understand this formula. I will tell you when we use this formula, how we use it, that all we'll understand. But for now, the understanding of the terms is important. So let's begin with the first method of uh, investment appraisal which is the accounting rate of return. So this method actually uses the net profit that is calculated as per the invest as per the income statement and this net profit is expressed as the percentage of average amount of investment made. Basically the formula is average annual profit that you will earn because of the investment divided by the average investment value multiplied by 100. So this uh, rate, this accounting rate of return will be arrived at in percentage terms. For example, let's say if you invest $500 in any project and you are going to earn a average annual profit of $50. So you can say that you're going to make an accounting rate of return of 10% uh, annually. How do you get the average annual profit? So let's say the life of the project uh, is five years, which means you expect that the project or the investment opportunity will be available or will continue for five years. So you calculate what will be the total expected profit during those five years and you divide it by five. So you'll get your average annual profit. Then how do you get your average investment? See, there are two components to this. The first one is this where you calculate the, you add up the initial investment in the project plus the residual value of the project at the end and you divide the entire thing by two. So let me explain the logic of this. How do you calculate the average of anything? So you take the opening value, you take the closing value and you divide by two. So you get the middle value, basically the average. Same way, how would you calculate the average investment in any project? Whatever amount you invested in the beginning, that's the initial investment, plus whatever is the worth of that investment at the end, which is the residual value at the end, and you divide by two, so you get the average amount invested in that project. 
So this will be first part of the average investment. Then later on you see WC which means working capital that is added separately. Why? Because apart from your initial investment, let's say initial investment could be to purchase machinery that will be used to reduce production and sell in the market. But apart from that investment in machinery, the business may also have to invest in the working capital. Let's say to maintain some kind of inventory, to give credit to customers, so there may be some debtors involved. Working capital investment may be required additionally apart from the initial investment. So that will be added separately. Question is why isn't working capital divided by two? Why is there no average for working capital? Because whatever working capital you put in the business, that does not lose its value by the end of the project. The working capital just gets rotated in the business. Let's say you've invested working capital in form of cash. It may get converted to inventory. That may get converted to debtors. That may again get converted to cash. But that working capital will remain intact even at the end of the project. So there is no need to calculate the opening working capital plus the closing working capital or residual value and then divide by two only for the this is only done for the initial investment and not for the working capital. Working capital will be additionally added to the average. So that way you get your average investment and then you will use this formula to get how much percentage do you expect annually from the project on the average investment made. So once you calculate the average investment uh, sorry accounting rate of return what can you interpret obviously projects with the highest accounting rate of return will be uh, will be chosen will be preferred why because let's say you have two projects project a and project b if project a is giving you an accounting uh, rate of return of 15 percent while project b is giving you an accounting rate of return of 10 percent so you choose project a because a higher accounting rate of return just indicates that the project is more profitable so you choose that Another advantage of accounting rate of return is it's very easy to calculate and understand because net profits are usually calculated for any business so that it's numbers available in when all the numbers that you see in this formula is readily available you have to just calculate the accounting rate of return there is no complication in the calculation here and it's also easy to understand it's expressed in percentage terms so you can just calculate the percentage and anyone can understand what does it mean there's no difficulty in that also. But when it comes to disadvantages of this method, first of all, there is an element of bias involved in calculation of profits because certain accounting principles are applied when calculating the net profit. For example, there is always a choice in the method of depreciation, the choice in the method in which inventory moves, fee for option is available or weighted average cost is available. So at various places in accounting, human bias is involved and that may affect the calculation of profits. So it may be difficult for anyone to compare between two methods if bias is involved. And also the this method ignores the time value of money. Basically it doesn't give, give higher importance to the profits that are earned in the initial years and less importance to the profits that are earned in the later years. It's giving equal importance to the profits earned in all the years over the life of the project because a simple average is taken of the of the total profits. So the time value of money concept itself is ignored, which is not practical because let's say you have two projects. If in project A you're receiving most of the profits or cash in the initial years, you will prefer that project because you will recover your initial investment sooner and you can use that money to invest elsewhere also. So any project where you receive your cash earlier may be preferred over projects where you receive your cash later. But in this method, importance is not given to when the cash or profit is received. So this is about accounting rate of return. Let's quickly look at an example on accounting rate of return. So directors of company wish to invest in a new factory and have given the following information. Cost of the factory is 400,000. So this becomes our initial investment. Useful life of the factory is five years. It's expected to run for five years. Revenues in year are $150,000 and it is expected to grow at 5% each year. Direct cost in year one is $75,000 expected to grow over, grow at 10 2% each year. Depreciation will be calculated at straight line method over and above the direct cost. So let's do the calculation of net profit first. So in year one, our revenues will be $150,000. 
cost will be 75,000. Now depreciation is straight line method and our cost of the factory is 400,000. So I'll say 400,000 divided by 5 that gives us 80,000 depreciation every year. So 80,000. So in depreciation, I'll say 80,000. So that way, if I calculate my net profit, I'm getting minus 5,000 for year one. We're going to do the same thing for each of the five years because the life of the project is five years. So you have to do it for five years. The revenues will increase every year by 5%. So let me calculate for every year and just write it. Year two revenue becomes 157,500. Then year three revenue becomes 165,375. Year four revenue 173,644 and year 5 revenue 182, 326. Tariff costs are expected to increase at 2% each year. So I'm just going to add 2% to the previous year and write it for the current year. So year 2, if I add 75,000 plus 2%, I will get 76,500. Then same for year 3, if I add 76,500 into 2% and add, add that to 76,500, I'll get 78,030 then for year 4 79,591 and 81,083 83. depreciation is going to remain same every year 80,000 80,000 and for year 4 and 5 also 80,000 each so that way net profit will be revenues minus direct cost minus depreciation. So for year two, net profit is 1000. For year three, it is 7345. For year four, it is 14,053. And for year five, it is 21,143. So once you get the net profit, for all the years, what you have to do is you have to calculate the average annual profit, which is what the total profit divided by the life of the project. Total profit, if I add up for all the five years, I will get total profit of 38,541 divided by five years. So average annual profit works out to $7,708.2. Average investment will be the initial investment in the project, which is 400,000 plus the residual value of the project, which is not given here. Residual value means that at the end of the project life, uh, which is five years, uh, can we sell our assets for a certain value that becomes the residual value but here there is no information about that so we assume that is zero so 400,000 divided by z uh, plus zero divided by two so we get average investment value of 200,000. So now we can get our accounting rate of return as 7,708 divided by 200,000 into 100. So we get our accounting rate of return as 3.85%. So let's say you have multiple opportunities. So you can calculate the accounting rate of return for all these opportunities and wherever the accounting rate of return is highest, you can choose that uh, project or investment, obviously subject to other non-financial factors that you may want to consider. Then we have something called the payback period, which is the second method of investment appraisal. So payback period is that time, maybe in number of years, number of months, whatever, is that time period in which the cash inflows are sufficient enough to cover the initial investment in the project. A rough example, let's say you invest $100,000 in a project. So when is it that you're going to recover at least that $100,000? Let's say you expect to recover it and you expect to recover that money in three years. So your payback period becomes three years. Whatever you receive after three years, which is after recovering your initial investment, that is the additional cash flow in the project. In payback period, our aim is to recover our initial investment as soon as possible. So how do you calculate your payback period? 
the initial investment divided by the annual cash flow. So whatever you get here, that will be expressed in number of years. And this time period will tell you that, okay, in these many years, you will recover your initial investment in the project. So once you calculate a payback period, how do you interpret it or how do you use it? Projects with the lowest payback period will obviously be preferred because low payback period means that you're recovering your initial investment sooner and obviously that will be preferred. It is very easy to calculate and easy to understand also. It's when, why, why do we say easy to understand? Because when you know the payback period of two projects, you can quickly compare and decide which one is better. It gives importance to the cash flows here rather than the net profit. So previous method, if you remember, we used net profit and then one of the disadvantages was that net profit calculations involve human bias. But when it comes to cash flow, it's the bi human bias in element is much less compared to the net accounting profits or calculation of net profit. Now coming to the disadvantages of this method, this method ignores the time value of money. Basically it does not give higher importance to cash flows that are received earlier during the life of the project. It gives equal importance to all the cash flows that are received throughout the life of the project. Because if you see the formula, the denominator it says annual cash flow. Here it does not make any difference between the cash flows that are received earlier and cash flows that are received later. Also, this method does not give importance to the entire life of the project. Basically, the cash flows that are received after the payback period are completely ignored. So for example, there are two projects A and B. In case of A, the payback period is let's say two years, while in case of B, the payback period is let's say uh, four years. The total life of the project is five years. Now, obviously looking at this, one would prefer project A over project B because the payback period is lower, initial investment is recovered faster. But what if I tell you that the total cash flows that you receive are much higher in project B compared to project A. Even though in project A you're recovering your initial investment faster or sooner, but the total cash flows that you will receive are less. So this method is basically ignoring what happens after the payback period is achieved. So that is the disadvantage here. Basically, before deciding on the opportunity that you have, you have to look at the cash flows, the total cash flows of the projects and then finally take a decision. So let's uh, do an example here. The same example will continue for this method also. Cost of the factory, 400,000. Useful life was five years. Revenues, direct costs don't change. Depreciation, even though it's given here, but for this method, depreciation will become irrelevant or in fact, for any method that uh, uses cash flow, De depreciation becomes irrelevant. Depreciation is only useful when net profit calculations are required, which is in case of accounting rate of return. So uh, let's uh, calculate. In fact, the revenues and direct costs, we've already done the calculation earlier. So I'm just going to write it down here and then we will continue to the other columns. So we have our revenues and direct cost column ready. The net cash flow will be the difference between the revenues and the direct cost. So first year it will be 150,000 minus 75,000, which is 75,000. Same way I'm going to do for all the years. So 81,000 for year two, 87,345 for year three, 94,053 and 101, 143 for year five. Cumulative cash flow is the total cash flow till date. So for year one, it'll be 75,000. For year two, it'll be the year one and year two cash flows in total. So that is 75 plus 81, which becomes 156,000. Then for year three, it'll become all the cash flows till year three. So basically 156,000 that we got till year two plus year three cash flows, 87,345. So we get 240. 3, 345 then same way for year 4 we get 337 398 and finally year 5 438 541 so now that we have our cumulative cash flow let's see what would be our payback period payback period means the time period in which we are recovering our initial investment and what is our initial investment 400000 so we'll see when do we finally recover our initial investment Definitely not in year one because in year one we just received 75,000. Until year two we received 156,000 which is also not 
uh, up to 400,000 or it's less than 400,000. Same for year 3. Uh, year 4 also we've just recovered 337, 398 until year 4. So our payback period is definitely more than 4 years. Now in year 5, we have cumulatively received 438, 541 which is greater than our initial investment. So definitely our payback period lies somewhere between 4, four and 5. Basically after the completion of 4th year but before the uh, completion of 5th year. That's what our payback period will be. So let's calculate our payback period. So since we know that our payback period is 4 years plus a few months so we will say 4 years plus the number of months that we'll have to calculate. Now how do we do that? So until the 4th year how much did we recover? 337, 398. So to complete our payback period how much extra cash flow would we need to recover in the fifth year? The difference 400,000 that we need to recover in total minus what we recovered until the year 4 until the end of year 4 337 398 so this difference is what we need to recover extra in year 5 so as to complete our payback period now this we will divide by the year 5 cash flow which is 101 143 why because we will be assuming that whatever cash flows we received in year 5 which is 101 143 we will receive it equally throughout the year so in the numerator we have what we need to receive in year 5 and in denominator we have the we have totally how much we received in year 5 so when we divide this numerator and by the denominator what we will get is we'll get the number of months in which we've recovered the additional amount to complete the recovery of 400,000 as initial investment so this comes out to 4 years plus uh, 0.142751 years uh, we will convert it into number of months so 4 years plus 1.7 months how do you convert it into years you can multiply this by 12 or even in the formula here what you can do is you can multiply this by 12 to get this in number of months so 4 years and 1.7 months is the payback period which means exactly in 4 years and 1.7 months the uh, the project will complete cash inflows of 400,000 which is the initial investment and whatever extra inflows are there that will come uh, till the end of the uh, life of the project so that's the calculation of payback period then coming to the third uh, method which is the net present value method now this method involves discounting all the future cash flows to their present time ca basically calculating the present value of the future cash flows why because this method is giving importance to time value of money the later the cash flows are received uh, during the life of the project the lower will be their present value and that is how this method is giving importance to time value of money so basically present value of all cash flows have to be calculated using the uh, discounting factor or the discounting rate and then the net present value will be calculated to see whether that pro project should be undertaken or no or the present value or the net present value of this certain project will be compared to the net present value of other projects to see which one is more suitable so how do you calculate the net present value? Basically present value of all the future cash flows we will have to calculate and that will be uh, you know the initial investment made will be deducted from that present value to see how much is the net present value. If that net present value is negative which will happen if the initial investment is greater than the present value of all future cash flows. In that case if this is negative we will ignore the project we will not undertake because the moment you see a negative net present value it shows uh, erosion of wealth it shows that you would be better off not investing in the project rather than investing in uh, the money lying idle is better than investing in a project with negative NPV but if the net present value is positive then you could undertake that project because then it shows a uh, increase in wealth because of undertaking the project and if uh, you're comparing two or more projects, the projects with the uh, highest NPV will be preferred. Uh, okay, how do you calculate the present value of cash flows? If you remember uh, in previous slides, I told you how do you calculate present value of anything? 
the amount or the cash flow here multiplied by the discounting factor. I've already explained the meaning of this and this will be given in the uh, given in the uh, questions and exams. So you have to just multiply. Uh, once you calculate your NPV, what, how do you interpret it? How do you use it? So all projects with positive NPV can be accepted. This is what I told you. And if the projects are mutually exclusive, if the projects are mutually exclusive, then the projects with the highest NPV will be chosen, obviously, because mutually exclusive projects means you, you can choose either of them. The time value of money is not ignored. So this is an advantage here compared to the previous two methods. So this method is using the cash flows compared to the accounting profits. This is also an advantage. Now, disadvantage of this method is that when you compare using this method, when you compare two or more projects, which are of different sizes, like one project where initial investment is, let's say hundred thousand dollars and the other project where initial investment is $1 million. Obviously you cannot use this method because the net present value that you will, uh, you will calculate in case of these projects, they are not comparable. The size of the project is different. The initial investment is different. Obviously returns expectations will be different. So this method will yield incorrect results. If you compare projects of different sizes, that's the disadvantage. Let's see, uh, the, let's understand this method better with an example. So the same example, we're going to continue cost of the factory initial investment, 400,000 life is five years. Revenues, direct costs don't change. Depreciation is straight line again, not very relevant. Cost of the capital is 5%. Uh, why is this important? Because then this forms the basis of our calculation of discounting factor or the basis of the use of discounting factor because discounting factor would be different for different rates, different interest rates. So you'll have to use that discounting factor that is suitable with the cost of capital of the firm. Uh, don't worry about it. The discounting relevant discounting factor will always be given in the question. I'm just explaining the meaning of the relevance or the importance of cost of capital and the discounting factor. So let's calculate the net present value or in fact the present value of the cash flows and then we will calculate the net present value. Okay. Uh, so let's fill in this table your zero. Whenever you're doing this method in the calculation of net present value. Okay, we will make this calculation of net present value. Uh, before year one, two, three, four, five, you have to start with year zero because this is the year when you're making the initial investment. This also should be presented in the table. So year zero, the net cash flow here becomes minus 400,000, which is the inv investment made, initial investment made. Why minus? Because here it's an outflow. The discounting factor for year zero will always be one because this 400,000 is at present time and the present value of that will obviously be the same 400,000. So how do I get the present value of cash flow here? We have to multiply net cash flow with the discounting factor. Now year one, two, three, four, and five, we've already calculated the cash flows in the previous uh, slide where we did the payback period example. I'm just going to copy down those numbers here. So our cash flows were 75,000, 81,000, 87,345, 94,053, and 101,143. So in exam or in uh, any of the questions that you're doing, if the cash flows are not directly given, you might have to calculate revenues would be given or some other details would be given. You'll have to calculate the net cash flows. Now, discounting factor, if you see the previous slide is given here, we will be using the same discounting factors. So for year one discounting factor 0 0.952, then 0 0.907, 0 0.864, 0 0.823 and 0 0.784. The present value of, of these cash flows, which is the 75,000, 81,000, 87,345, this will be calculated by multiplying the cash flows or the future value with the discounting factor. We're going to also round it off. We're not going to take decimals. So 
first one is 71 400 75,000 into 0 0.952 and then we have 73,467 75,466 77,406 and 79,296 now if you see the total that you see of year 1 2 3 4 and 5 the present value of the cash flows in year 1 2 3 4 5 this will be the present value of all future cash flows but when i take into account the initial investment also that's when i get the net present value basically the net present value is the difference between the present value of all future cash flows and the initial investment the net of uh, all cash flows of year zero until the end of the project so when we calculate the uh, net present value here we get negative 22,965 what does this negative 22,965 means it means that if this project is undertaken in present value terms the firm or anyone who's making this investment will lose this much amount of money which is $22,965 this amount will be lost so clearly this project should not be undertaken okay if I have to calculate it using the formula that we saw in the previous uh, slide the net present value is equal to the present value of all future cash flows minus the initial investment so present value of all future cash flows is nothing but the total of uh, present value of cash flows from year 1 to year 5 which is 377,035 minus 400,000 so negative 22,965 it's the same thing but why did I present it in this manner because this is how you'll see normally in the marking scheme or the answer sheets the year zero is always taken and the net present values is calculated in the same table so that completes our calculation of the net present value for this example finally we have the last method the internal rate of return method what do you mean by internal rate of return it is that rate of return for which or using which if we discount our future cash flows if we use the relevant discounting factor associated with that rate we will get a zero NPV so in the previous uh, method what happened they gave us the rate they gave us the discounting factor and we had to calculate the NPV now what you're doing in this method is we want the NPV to be zero so for that what should be the relevant discounting rate or the relevant cost of capital if you think in the previous method terms what should be the relevant discounting factor that should be used so as to get a zero NPV that rate is nothing but the internal rate of return you could think about this as the expected rate of return that the firm is making on any project let's say if you get internal rate of return as five percent it means that the firm expects to make five percent on the project just telling you broadly so IRR is an indication of the annualized rate of return generated when uh, when you're investing in that project the formula looks a little complicated here so to calculate this internal rate of return you need two things first you need a rate a discounting rate that yields a positive NPV uh, in the previous example we saw that there was a negative NPV uh, basically 5% was the discounting rate and that 5% yielded negative NPV but in this method we need two discounting rates we need one discounting rate that yields a positive NPV so this is rate 1 and we need a rate 2 that yields a negative NPV so we need both these rates also and we also need the value of the NPVs the positive NPV and the negative NPV if this is confusing just hold on for a few minutes once we go to the example you'll understand better I'll just explain the formula here first so how do you get your internal rate of return you start with the positive rate uh, the rate that yields a positive NPV basically the rate 1 to that you add so bracket the broader brackets open first you take the difference between the positive 
uh, rate that gives the positive NPV and rate that gives the negative NPV. Basically, if uh, let me take example, just rough example. Let's say the rate that yields positive NPV is 10% and the rate that yields negative NPV is let's say 4%. So in our formula, we what we'll do is we start with 10% plus the difference between the rates, which is 10 minus 4 this multiplied by now P is the positive NPV that is generated because of the 10% rate. Let's say hypothetically speaking, if this turns out to be 5000 and in denominator, we have the positive NPV minus the negative NPV. But when you subtract and in bracket, you have a negative number, this automatically becomes plus. So let's say positive NPV we already know is 5000 and let's say the negative NPV was 3000. So 5000 plus 3000 and when you solve for this, you'll get the internal rate of return. We'll do an example and after that it will become better. Now coming to the interpretation of this, uh, how do you interpret it? So let's say for two projects, uh, how would you know which project is better? A higher IRR is better. So you will choose a project with higher IRR. Other advantages of this project, it gives importance to the cash flows rather than accounting profits. Obviously there's no net profit here, they're using the cash flow. Time value of money is not ignored. That's also an advantage, but there are some disadvantages also. In some cases, there, there may be multiple internal rate of returns for which the NPV of the project may be zero. And this happens when apart from the initial investment, there are other cash outflows also during the life of the project. You just need to, uh, you know, remember briefly about this point. You don't need to go into detail because that much detail, they're not going to test you at this level and also the project cash flows the cash flows that are generated during the life of the project let's say you're selling some goods and you receive goods or receive money from your customer so this method assumes that this that money is reinvested at the same internal rate of return basically this is assuming that the firm is will always have an opportunity to reinvest the intermediate cash flows at the same rate which may not be always possible uh, if you think about realistic world so that may be unrealistic at times last two points it is just better to just remember the theory because you may have to just write it in exam you may not or you need no need to go into the details but we will look at an example and let's see so same example 400,000 initial investment five years life revenue same direct cost same then if you see here discounting factors are given for five percent and for two percent why uh, are there uh, discounting factors given for two uh, rates? Because I told you for this method, we need two rates. One that yields a negative NPV and the, another one that yields a positive NPV. So if you remember from the previous example, we already calculated NPV using 5% rate and that was a negative NPV. So in this example, what we're going to do, first we will be using 2% rate. We'll use these discounting factors and calculate NPV. And hopefully this should be a positive NPV. Then only we can proceed ahead with the calculation of internal rate of return. So let's go ahead. I'll again uh, fill in the first two columns from the previous example. The numbers are the same. So let's fill in the discounting factor column. Year zero will always be one. And for year one, two, three, four, five, we're going to take discounting factor for 2% rate, which is given in the previous slide. I'm just going to copy these numbers here. So 0 0.98. 0 0.961, 942, 924, and 906. So present value of cash flows will be just the multiplication of net cash flow and the discounting factor. So first one minus 400,000, then second one will be 73,500. Year two, previous one was year one, then year two will be 77,841. Year 3 will be 82,279. Year 4 will be 86,905. And year 5 will be 91,636. To calculate the NPV, we will have to take the total of all the positive and the initial negative cash flow. We get a positive NPV of 12,161. So, yes, we have a positive NPV. So, what do we have now? We have 5% discounting factor, 5% rate that, uh, using which we calculated negative NPV of 22,965. 
and then we have 2% discounting rate using which we calculated a positive NPF of 12,161. We need this information to calculate the IRR. So what is IRR? I'll first write on the formula so that it becomes easy. The rate that yields the positive NPV plus the rate, the difference between the rates. So RN minus RP rate that yields negative minus the rate that yields positive. This will be multiplied by the uh, by a number in which the numerator is positive NPV and in denominator we have the difference between the positive and the negative NPV but this difference when we open the brackets it becomes plus because minus of negative it becomes plus okay let's put in the numbers 2% plus 5 minus 2 in numerator we have 12161 which is the positive NPV then in denominator 12,161 plus 22,965. So let's simplify 2% plus uh, 5 minus 2 will be 3, 3% 3 multiplied by 12,161 in the numerator and denominator if we add them we get 35,126. Uh, so when you do the calculations, you will get 2% plus 1, 0 0.04038, we'll round it off to two decimal places, so 1.04%, which means IRR is 3.04%. What does this mean? This means that uh, if you try to discount the cash flows using this rate, you will get a negative NPV. In fact, you can try that on your calculator. Try to do it manually if you if you want to do it. And then you will realize that the NPV that you get using this discounting factor 3.04 that comes to zero or near zero because this method that we've done, that's an estimation. So it may not be always zero, it will be almost uh, near to zero. So that's how we calculate IRR and whichever project yields the highest IRR that will be chosen. That's how you use the internal rate of return method. So that completes this chapter. I hope uh, you've understood this chapter. I've tried my best to explain the methods as briefly as possible, but also at the same time, I've made sure uh, to give you all the details that you need to know. Uh, make sure you practice questions uh, using uh, these methods using what you've learned in this video. If you like the content, please uh, share it with your friends. Also, please like the channel, uh, subscribe the channel, like the video. It will help me to reach out more students. I'll see you soon in the next video.